Today, or this morning, is about challenge. And we're really looking about uh, in circumstances and situations in which the Lord either faced challenge or else dealt with challenge in some way or, or other. He might have challenged other people. So we'll look at some of those examples. This is, I don't know how you feel about this whole situation of, of being in situation in, of, of challenge. Um, I think for myself, I would, I would probably say that I'm a conflict-averse person. <laughs> I, I really don't like those situations where you might have to say something. You might feel obliged or it's expected that you have to say something to somebody about something that, that kind of just might be challenging to them. And, and part of that is there might be a response to that, which then gets into, into deeper argument, perhaps, or, or conflict. Um, and, and it's just uncomfortable. And I think for years that, and probably still to some extent, uh, inhibited my willingness, I suppose, to um, in some ways engage in conversations about faith with people for fear that I would be challenged about my faith and that, um, you know, I'd, I'd have to get into those kind of, of conversations and, and maybe people would sort of shoot me down in, in my faith. So it, you kind of shrink back a little bit from that. Over the years, I've come to realize that despite those kind of feelings, despite whatever natural inhibition or inclination we may have along those lines, there are times when you've got to put your head above the parapet and you've got to be prepared either to be shot down for, for, for what you do believe in and maybe there are times when uh, we need to um, take up a word of challenge uh, towards others as well. And we'll, we'll have a look at, at those sort of circumstances. But we're focusing on the Lord Jesus, and we're, we're trying to see through all of, all of these different topics, we're, we're trying to see how the Lord handled uh, the various real-life human experiences and what we can take from that. I think it's a difficult thing. David, in his opening talk, um, really presented this. In, in a sense, it's a bit of a tension between Christ the God-man and Christ the man. And, and at, at which point um, does his divinity come into play? At which point does his humanity come into play? Or are they always meshed together in, in what he does? So sometimes we look at examples of the Lord Jesus in his life and think, well, he, he was God. And he could do that. I'm not God. I can't do that. I can't be like that. I can't follow that example. But hopefully we'll be able to bring out some, some aspects in which we can uh, follow some kind of example. Now, when you go through the Gospels and you look at the, the life of the Lord Jesus and you observe his interactions, it seems to me there, there are probably three, three areas in which the Lord involved, was involved in challenge or involved himself in challenging um, other people. So if um, I can have better luck than Gareth did the other night, it doesn't look like it. All right, James, if you want to just put that first slide up then, please. So the first one is, is how the Lord dealt with um, his critics and his detractors. And we read in the Gospels time and time again that the ruling religious elite, the scribes and the Pharisees and the elders of the people, they, they would often be looking for opportunity to criticize the Lord, looking for opportunity to, to bring a, a charge or some kind of accusation against him. Uh, and the Lord... We've got some examples of that. We'll look at one or two. But this was the atmosphere that the Lord was, was constantly um, involved in when the, the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders came uh, against him. Let's turn to Matthew 22 and look at one example there. Matthew 22, verse 15. <clears throat> and the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their malice and said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. He said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And, he, after, and hearing this, they were amazed. And leaving him, they went their way. It's amazing, isn't it? That these, they come with this accusation, and, and the Lord calls them out on their hypocrisy, straight in there. And the, the hypocrisy, of course, was that they were... They were wanting him to incriminate himself 
against the Roman authorities, wanting him to prove himself a rebel. I guess they were wanting him to say, don't pay the tax to Caesar, we don't like the Romans. And therefore, they would use that against him and report him to the Roman authorities. But they themselves were the very ones who were subverting the Roman authorities. There's the hypocrisy. And the Lord saw through it, and he saw their malice. And he's right in there, and he, he, he faces them up. And they're challenging him, but he challenges them straight away uh, in regard to their hypocrisy. So there were times when the Lord was, was very direct, uh, of course, very perceptive in knowing the hearts of those who were, and the minds of those who were coming against him, and able to, to get right in to, to what the issue was. And so he was able to call them out, as he did time and time again in their hypocrisy. In contrast to that, let's look at another example in John chapter 8. <clears throat> Verse 2, early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people were coming to him and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and having set her in the center, they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone, and the woman where she was, in the center. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go. From now on, sin no more. Again, the religious leaders coming and wanting to trap Jesus. And they knew what the law of Moses was in these circumstances. And it seems to me that probably they thought the Lord was too lenient. He had too lenient a view, too lenient an interpretation of the law of Moses compared to theirs, their harsh, hard line. And they were thinking, Jesus will go soft on this woman <laughs> uh, against the law of Moses, and therefore we've got him. And Jesus masterfully dealt with that situation as well. But he did it in, in a very, I suppose, non-confrontational sort of way, we would say, in, on this occasion. He's just, he's just writing in the dust in the ground to begin with. We don't, we don't know what he wrote. All the clamor that was going on, and, and these, these people around really wanting to, to give this woman what they believe to be her just desserts. And probably not a little anger. And in the midst of it all, the Lord is just calmly writing on the ground. And then when he does face up, he does it calmly. And he does it in a measured and a tempered way. And they just melt away. Convicted about their, their own sin in their own hearts. So then we think about Peter's... <clears throat> this is coming, still not coming. There we are. We think about... Not that one. Thank you. Peter's comment, his first-hand comment and observations about the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he didn't utter threats. And... We think about that particularly, of course, focused in, in terms of the sufferings that the Lord Jesus went through in, in the, the time prior to the cross. But this is characteristic of the Lord Jesus, uh, I suggest to you, in all the ways that, that he dealt. That though people came against him, and though they had harsh and unjustified things to say against him, bringing all sorts of charges against him, his response was measured, was with grace, tempered with deep grace. And the Lord didn't lose his temper as, as we think about it in those situations and didn't get hot under the collar, but he dealt with the issues and he dealt with the challenges in this kind of way, this kind of measured, um, dignified, self-controlled sort of way. So those were some examples, of, numerous examples there are, of how Jesus dealt with those who came to challenge him. And, and their challenges were, were hostile challenges. 
sometimes challenges we face may not necessarily be hostile. There's, there's genuine uh, desire to, to know truth. So that brings us on to uh, the next kind of category of, of people that I think the Lord was involved in when it came to challenge. Uh, next slide up there, James. <clears throat> and we're thinking about um, those sometimes we call seekers or not yet believers, people who were coming to the Lord and they were, they were on a, a journey of faith, a journey of discovery, and the Lord knew where they were in their journey, and they just needed a challenge to take the next step. <clears throat> they just needed to be challenged about uh, what lay ahead for them to go deeper into fuller faith. Uh, and so the Lord dealt with these people, of course, in, uh, sometimes in a different sort of way. Let's turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I kept all these things from my youth up. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But at these words he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. He seemed so close, didn't he, this guy? He'd done and was doing so much right. Uh, so much in obedience and faithfulness to the commands as, as he would have been instructed to live by them as a Jewish man in, in his time. And it's, it's never seemed to me that this was an idle boast of this young man, that he'd kept these things since his youth up. A statement of fact and a statement of truth, it seems to me. But the Lord knew there was an issue that was preventing him, an obstacle stopping him from going forward into, into full of faith. Um, something to do with his grasp on material things and his unwillingness to, to let those things go. And that's what the Lord challenged him on. Gently challenged him on. Just go and sell all of this. Get all that lot sorted out and then come and follow me. Was the Lord right? Well, you know the answer to that question. Was the Lord right in challenging him in this way? He'd come so far, he'd done so much right. Was there another way that the Lord could have dealt with this situation to encourage the man and to bring him on? Another way he could have approached it to be more embracive, perhaps? It's not for us to say there could be any other way. The Lord, when it comes to um, conversions, I think we would say he's not interested in conversion by compromise. And... He knew that there was this issue in this young man's life. And if he was going to go on in fullness of faith and be a follower of the Lord and be a disciple, then this issue needed, needed dealing with. And this is a situation where it seems to us, as we read it in, in, the, in the narrative, that the outcome was disappointing because the Lord didn't win this man, seemingly. We don't know what might have happened subsequently, but we just take... What we're told in the scriptures, he went away sad. And seemingly at that point, didn't, didn't take on that challenge of the Lord. And we assume, of course, that the Lord knew that that would be the outcome. That that's how this man would react. Nevertheless, he still needed to be faced up with that particular challenge. The Lord spoke the truth in love. It says he, he looked at him and, and he had a love for him. Um, but he spoke the truth in love as to what the situation was for that man. Uh, Proverbs 15:23 A man has joy in an apt answer. And how delightful is a timely word or a word in season as some of the the other versions might have it. We might think it's it's something of a skill or something of a gift to be able to um, speak such a word to to be able to be so perceptive to have a timely word to speak to somebody who we might senses on a journey of faith and to say the right word at the right time a word in season just to bring that person further on to to give them that extra little challenge about taking the next step into full of faith uh, maybe that's a gift uh, maybe it's a gift unique to the lord 
Is it something that is available to us as well? Is that something that we can engage in? Is it possible that we can have that timely word, that word in season that's just going to challenge somebody who's on a journey of faith that we have the opportunity to be in conversation with and just to say something to them? How do we get that perception? How does it come about that we can be sensitized to that? Gareth took us to uh, Isaiah 50, verse 4. The Lord has given me the tongue of disciples, that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. The experience of the Lord Jesus and one of those um, customs that Ben was, was talking to us about um, as well, the, the custom of the Lord to have that time of communion with his Father on a daily basis. And in that time of communion, just having that that sense of of being in the presence of his God and Father, giving him whatever's whatever's needed, and and just enabling him to, to be able to have that timely word and that word in season. And I think that's the example for us as well. That the more time we spend in the presence of the Lord in communion with the Lord, in prayer, and in his word, then the Spirit of God uses, uses that time, uses those opportunities to sensitize our own hearts, to give us a sensitivity to how the Spirit of God may be moving. And we might not realize it at, a, at the time, but we can be those that the Lord can use to speak that timely word, to that word of challenge to somebody who's on the journey of faith. And it, it might be uh, that that makes the difference. It might be that it's what George Prasher would often speak of as being a link in the chain of testimony. You don't know whereabouts you are, which link you are in that chain, but what you say, your timely word, the word in season to somebody, is building on somebody else's and there's something else yet to come and it all leads ultimately to somebody coming to know the Lord Jesus. So prayerful preparation and expectation that in the exercise of communion through prayer with the Lord on a daily basis, spending that time in his presence and being moved by the Spirit uh, will enable us, I suggest, and sensitize us to being aware of those opportunities where we can bring a challenge to to somebody in much the same way that, that the Lord did in facing somebody up gently but nevertheless, facing them up with perhaps uh, what they need to do to overcome and to move forward in full of faith. <clears throat> so then the, the third aspect of challenge, if we move up next slide there, thank you, is when the Lord challenged his own disciples. And I, I wonder how we would characterize the way the Lord challenged his disciples. Some examples here, Matthew 16 and, and 23. Um, if you put that slide up there, up first, thank you. Uh, this was after the Lord had, um, well, well, Peter had made that great confession about the Lord. Um, and, and the Lord had said to, to Peter, uh, this has been revealed to you by, by my Father. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And from that time, it says that Jesus started to speak to them about Um, how he would be handed over to the chief priests and the elders and how he would suffer and die and on the third day be raised again. And Peter said, not so, Lord. What are you talking about? That's never going to happen to you. No way. And this was the Lord's response. Oh, okay. Uh, Next one, James. Matthew tells us that it's one of the disciples who asked this question about... um, about burying, um, burying the dead, burying their own family. And it's this great challenge, of course, to um, uh, the commitment of discipleship and the fullness of that. And it seems that people were saying these things quite reasonably, the disciples amongst them saying these things quite reasonably. Well, first let me do this. Let me take care of this legitimate priority. Let me take care of that other legitimate priority. And the Lord says, no, you just come and follow me. Okay. Uh, next one is Mark 7 and 17. 
When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. He said to them, are you so lacking in understanding? <laughs> There's a certain expression that we might use in, <laughs> in our words today. Are you so lacking in understanding? Do you not get it? And how many times did the Lord say that to his disciples? How many times did he challenge them? Do you not get what I'm saying here? Now, I suppose critics <clears throat> might take these examples and others and, and say, well, look at that. What, what kind of leader is he? He's berating his followers all the time. He's criticizing them. He's intolerant of them. He doesn't have patience with them. That's what some people might say. But we know that that is a gross caricature, a mischaracterization of the way the Lord dealt with his disciples. Because time and time again, there are innumerable examples of his abundant patience with his disciples and of his grace towards them and of his willingness to be patient and, and give them explanations. But nevertheless, there were times when he had to face them up with the reality of perhaps their lack of progress, their lack of understanding, their lack of commitment at times. How would we characterize then the way the Lord challenged his disciples in these situations? We wouldn't characterize them in, in those ways that, that critics would at all. And I think that we would say, next slide up, James, that the Lord was uncompromising. That's the thing, isn't it? He was uncompromising in his expectation of those who would be his followers. And think about it in terms of the disciples, those he had chosen, those who he had brought close to him, being in his company day by day, having the unspeakable privilege of hearing those words that, that dripped from his lips, the, the pure teaching of the Son of God, and his grace, and his mercy, and his love, and his very presence, they were the privileged ones to experience that. And time and again, the Lord did take them inside and say to them, here's what this means. They said, we don't quite get it. He said, well, this is what it's about. And he said to them, you are privileged ones. To you, it's been granted to know these things. Other people get them in parables, but you get the, you get the explanation. I'm here to teach you. And to show you these things. And they were immensely privileged. But the Lord was uncompromising in what he expected of them in return. Luke 12 and verse 48. Next slide, please, James. Everyone who's been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much of him. They will ask all the more. And, and I think that's the reality of what the Lord had called the disciples into, the privileged position that they'd had, what they'd had revealed to them, over and above and beyond what other people had had revealed to them. And therefore, there was a, an expectation on them. The Lord expected them to embrace this. The Lord expected them to commit themselves to this and to bring them into, through that expectation, through that uncompromising stance with them, to bring them into the experience of the deeper committed life of a follower of the Lord Jesus through which the purposes of God and the purposes of the Lord can be achieved more effectively, more fully, and more to the Lord's glory. So the Lord did that with his disciples. And as we think about ourselves and we think about our own interactions with one another as believers, and those that we might be in a position as, as perhaps being um, teachers of or mentors of other um, believers, are we, ought we to take this kind of position as well? To recognize that there are times when people need to be challenged about where they're at in their faith, in their commitment, in their life of obedience to the Lord? Is that something that we should take on? Yes, I think it is. <clears throat> Not from a point of view of any of us as individuals thinking that we've got it sorted, and, and I can say this to you because I'm there, but we take it on on the basis of the word of the Lord because we're not 
speaking and encouraging and challenging other people about what our expectations are of them. We're challenging them and encouraging them about what the Lord's expectations of them are. That's the message that we're transmitting. We're seeing the challenges and we're taking them to ourselves and we're recognizing the need for others to see those challenges and, and to make those deeper commitments and to step up to that deeper responsibility, recognizing that by virtue of being a disciple of the Lord Jesus, by virtue of having the, uh, the glory and the wonder of salvation revealed to us, and all that flows from that, that we've, we've had the opportunity to embrace that and to know the blessing of that, and therefore that puts us in a position of responsibility and obligation in terms of what our ongoing response to that is. And the Lord wants us to be committed more deeply. He expects that because he wants to use us. And so we can be involved in those kinds of challenging conversations with one another. And I think it's a good thing that we should be. But we do it on the basis of not saying, I think you should be doing this. Or I think this is the path that you should be walking. But these are the Lord's expectations. This is what the Lord shows us in his word, the way that we should be living. <clears throat> Does the, Lord, does the Lord expect too much of us? Isn't it sometimes all a bit unreasonable? Too much? Too demanding? Too full on? Too challenging? Is that sometimes how we might feel about what it is to be a follower of the Lord Jesus? Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 3, for consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you'll not grow weary and lose heart. <clears throat> consider him. Is it too demanding? Was it too demanding for the Lord to endure what he endured? Was it too challenging for him? Was it too much? No, it wasn't. He did it for each of us. And so the, the demands and the expectations that the Lord has of us and the challenges that come to us from his word and, and that we can encourage and challenge one another about as well are about our response, a recognition of what the Lord has done, the challenge that he rose to so perfectly and so lovingly and wonderfully in order that we can be the people that we are before him. And so surely our heart's response is we want to, <clears throat> we want to respond and, and be those committed disciples. So we can encourage one another and challenge one another with the Lord's expectations so that not, not, it's not about nitpicking, it's not about criticism or anything like that. This is about encouraging each one of us to be the best followers of Christ that we can be so that the Lord can use us so that his purposes can be fulfilled so that one day may it be that the Lord will be able to say to each one of us well done my good and faithful servant